Satan should buffet, though trials should come. Let this <clears throat> if you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7. When you get there, please stand with me to honor the reading of God's Word. If you don't have your Bibles, that just stand anyway. Some of you don't have your Bibles. I know you have the whole thing memorized. That's <laughs> fine. That's fine. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7, starting at verse 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Father, I thank you for your word. I ask you today, Father, for your anointing. Your word is anointed from the beginning, from the foundation of the world, Lord. But Lord, I pray that you would anoint the preaching of your word, that this message would have power and authority, Lord, that it would go forth and God, that it would find its mark upon the hearts of your people. I ask God for encouragement. I ask for a challenge. I ask, Lord, that uh, you would send forth your word to do, Lord, what you would have it do. I just ask, God, that your will would be accomplished in this place today and that Jesus Christ would receive the glory. We ask it in the name above all names. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. The title of my message this morning is The Cone of Uncertainty. The Cone of Uncertainty. We hear this term a lot, uh, especially in this time of the year, especially in this season. Do you know that this is hurricane season? Amen. We're fastly approaching the peak of hurricane season. I think it's September 10th if I'm not mistaken, is like just a week away, is the peak, the pinnacle, the midpoint, if you will, of hurricane season. We, you know, we see hurricanes coming this time of the year. And we hear this term, the cone of uncertainty. Remember just last week, we watched as Irene started a week and two, two weeks ago, a week and a half ago, we started, we watched this numbered storm, this tropical depression as it became a tropical storm and then it became Hurricane Irene and we watched it as it came across the ocean and uh, we had no idea where it was going. So the questions were asked, where will it go? Where will this hurricane go and, and how strong will it be when it touches land? Where will, will, will it make landfall? Where will the eye be and, and what will the winds be? Will, they, will the, sustains, uh, the sustained winds be uh, category two or one or, or, or how much damage is this going to be? Where is it going to land? There, it's uncertain. We don't know. And so the smartest people on the planet start plugging all their data and all their information and all their science and all their learning and all their experience. They, they combine and they discuss all this and they, and they plug all this into some of the greatest computers in the world to try and determine where will this thing go? How bad will it be? Some of the sharpest minds and the greatest computers go to work to answer this question. And after all this data and all this science and all this uh, uh, experience and all of these great minds and all of this computer power and all of this stuff combined works and churns and thinks to discover the final answer is we just don't know. <laughs> it's an educated guess. Hence the term, it's coming. <laughs> My graphics are a little slow this morning. But hence the term, uh, cone of uncertainty. They call it a cone 
of uncertainty because what they do is they take the inside model and they take the outside model and from where the storm is they project it could go this way it could go that way and so there is a cone do we have a, we do not have a cone so there is the cone of uncertainty you've seen it on tv <laughs> just imagine the cone of uncertainty See, because they know where the storm is and they, they could go this way and it could go that way and they just don't know. Friends, I find that life is one big cone of uncertainty. Because we know where we are. Most of us anyway. How many know where you are today? That's a good place to start. We know where we are, but we're not quite sure where we'll go. We could go this way. Life could go that way. Or it, it could go this way. And so at least on paper, it looks like a cone. We're, we're not quite sure, you know, where we're going. Somebody once said, in fact, you've heard it all your life, there are only two things in life that are certain. They are death and taxes. You can't escape either. No one gets out of here alive. And you're going to pay taxes. Or are, are there, is there anything else certain? In a world that is the cone of uncertainty, uh, is there anything else that's certain? Is this true that there are only two things that are certain in life? It depends on one's perspective. In what or in whom or where do you put your trust? In what or in whom or where do you put your trust? My first point this morning Oh, you should have seen how good it looked in my mind. First point this morning, if you'll allow me to take this text, and I want to just reverse the order here. Jesus gives uh, two pictures. He gives a picture of a wise builder, and he gives a picture of a foolish builder. I want to look at the foolish builder first. Jesus said in this text, he says, Those who hear these sayings of mine, what? Is he referring to those who hear these sayings of mine Jesus is saying those who hear my sayings see friends whenever you read the Bible you need to study it when he said these sayings of mine he's what is he referring to he's referring to everything that he has said prior to this look at the context and so we go back at least to chapter 5 and chapter 6 of Matthew when which is called the Sermon on the Mount the Beatitudes and Jesus is speaking on the, on the mountainside, and he's speaking to the crowd. He's speaking, remember, to Jews predominantly. And he's, he's, this is the, the sermon we call the Sermon on the Mount. He's, he's telling folks th this, this message. Jesus is uh, he's outlining, if you look at that, the Sermon on the Mount, chapters 5 and 6, he's outlining how a person should live. Remember, he's talking to Jews. What he does is he takes the Old Testament law, which, by the way, Paul tells us is a schoolmaster. You understand what that term means? Paul says in, in, uh, in Galatians chapter 3, verses 24 and 25, that the law is given as a schoolmaster because it teaches us how we ought to live and what we ought to do and Jesus takes the law, the Old Testament rigid law, the law of Moses, and he makes application. He takes the law and he makes application to the lives of those who follow him. You with me? So he takes that which is rigid, that which is fixed, and he applies it to the hearts of his people. Remember the law? Thou shalt and thou shalt not. What happens if you did when you shouldn't and you didn't do when you should? You died. The law said if you break the law of Moses, you die. Thou shalt not, and you die. You, thou shalt, and you didn't, you die. The, the law was rigid. It was fixed. Now, the Bible tells us in Romans that we are no longer under law, but under grace. How many are glad to hear that? We're no longer under the rigid law of God's where we had, to, we had to obey every single word or we would die. Because, friends, we have proven that it is impossible. We are fallen. We have 
disobeyed. We're born into sin and it is impossible for us to completely fulfill the law of God. And so if we were truly under law, we're all in trouble. We're no longer under law. We are now under grace. But let me explain this to you. The law was not discarded. God did not say, Jesus didn't say, well, I've come to fulfill the law. Now that it's fulfilled, we'll just forget it even existed. He did not discard the law. He fulfilled it. Listen, what this means is that no longer is the law written on tablets of stone, but on fleshly tablets of the heart. What Jesus did was he took the thou shalt and thou shalt not rigid law of God and he put it into the hearts of his people. So now you're here this morning not because the law says you have to be. Honor the Sabbath. Keep the Sabbath. Well, if you're here simply because the Bible said you had to be, you might as well stay home. Listen to me. If you do what you do because the law says you have to, you might as well quit doing it because you're not going to be able to keep the law anyway. The law is now written in the hearts and the tablets of the fleshly tablets of the heart. So now we come to church because we want to. We come to church because we love God and we want to worship him. His law is written in our hearts, no longer tablets of stone, but now in the tablets of the heart. So the Christian comes to church to worship God because they love him. Amen. 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 And everything we do, we do out of our love and of our, out of our relationship to Christ. So the law is now written in our hearts, no longer on stone, but now in the fleshly tablets of the heart. A heart filled with the love of God will desire to do those things contained in the law. Am I making sense to you? A heart filled with the love of God will do those things that the law says because that is written in the hearts of those who love him. Jesus' teaching is practical application of the will of God. He took that rigid law, thou shalt and thou shalt not, and he, he's making application to the heart of flesh, to the, to the heart of love that is following him. Listen, Jesus said, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Jesus kept the law perfectly. And so doing, he fulfilled our, mankind's, obligation to God. We could not fulfill the law. We could not please God. But Christ in our place fulfilled the law, pleased God, perfected the law. And so now in Christ, we are perfected before God. You with me? So the law, he didn't come to discard. He didn't say this no longer applies. He said, I'm going to show you how to apply the law to your life as a believer, as a follower of God. He said, for verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till it be fulfilled. Christ fulfilled that law. Do you understand what I mean? So when Jesus says, those who hear these sayings of mine, he's looking, he's taking the law of God and he's making application through the, through the uh, Sermon on the Mount. And he's saying to us, Though we need to hear those sayings of his. Listen, disregarding his sayings then is foolish. If we disregard what Jesus said, it's foolish. What, let's look at the Sermon on the Mount. I'm just going to pick out a few things that, that Jesus said. These sayings, you with me? These sayings of mine. If we don't hear and we don't obey these sayings of mine, it's a foolish thing to do. So let's look at some of the things that Jesus said. He said, be ye not angry. Or he said, don't be angry at your brother without a cause. Let me tell you something. There's, anger is a human emotion that God gave us. There's no sin in being angry. You come up here and kick me in the shin. I'm going to be angry. If I come and kick you back, I've sinned. You hear me? Anger is a real emotion. It, it happens. Somebody, anger without a cause is, is sinful. It, uh, it's, it's what you do with that anger that becomes sin. 
in your anger sin not, the Bible says. It doesn't say don't be angry, it just says don't sin. And Jesus is saying if you're angry without cause. And look at some of the things he said. Uh, he said that we are, if we call somebody um, empty-headed, if we call somebody an idiot, <laughs> how many times have you done that, driving down the highway? Ah, he's an idiot. <laughs> yeah, he's too loud. Jesus is saying that to have that attitude against somebody, that anger, that rage, is just the same as is murder. Because it comes from a heart that is not surrendered to God. He says, don't be angry without a cause. Don't call somebody empty-headed. Don't call somebody a fool. He said, because that, you're in danger of hell's fire. You with me? Why is, he, why is this so important? Because, friends, listen. In this life, wouldn't it be great if everybody thought just like you? Wouldn't it be wonderful? Wouldn't it just be wonderful if everybody thought exactly the way you do? But the fact is, none of we don't. We all think differently. And, you know, and I, and I say this a lot of times in counseling. It, it's like we're a, bunch of, we're a bunch of moving parts, machine parts. You know, God just kind of puts us all together. And, you know, as new parts, you know, uh, there's some, we, haven't worn, uh, we haven't worn together yet. And there's some, there's some rough edges. You know, new parts have rough edges and, and they wear on each other. There's friction uh, that happens until those parts wear into each other and now they fit. And now all those parts move nice and smoothly together because they've worn in to each other. You follow me? But in before then, there's friction, there's tension. There's little pieces that get knocked off. And, and, and it's, and it's, that's, what, that's what we are as the church. We're all moving parts. We're all individuals that God has put together like a machine. And there's some, you know, we don't like the way people do things. I really wish they wouldn't. I really wish it was warmer in here. I really wish it was colder in here. You know, I really wish the music was louder. I really wish it was quieter. I wish it was faster. I wish it was slower. I wish the, the chairs were harder. I wish... <laughs> We, we're working those things out. And, and Jesus is saying, don't be angry. Don't, don't look at somebody else and judge them and say, ah, oh, you're just an idiot because you don't agree with me. In fact, he says, if you have ought against one another, work those things out even before you come and offer your worship to God. Don't be angry. One of the sayings of Jesus. If you disregard this, it's foolish. He said, he addresses adultery in this context. Adultery, for those of you who don't know, is a sexual affair outside of the marriage covenant. It includes fornication, which is the unmarried. Folks that aren't married that are having sex outside of the marriage covenant. It's fornication. It comes under this, this whole uh, umbrella of adultery. And Jesus is saying, don't do it. But you see, our culture, Pastor... You're not going to grow a church that way. See, the young folks won't come if you talk about this stuff. Because in our culture, this is acceptable. And uh, if you start preaching against it, you're old-fashioned, and you won't get the young folks to come. You know, friends, I'm sorry, but that's what God's Word says. And he says, to don't, to don't do it. He says, he says, these are the sayings of mine. Adultery, which includes fornication. It includes voyeurism. I hate to make you uncomfortable, but it includes pornography and sexually explicit movies. Say, well, Pastor, I would never, ever, ever have an adulterous affair. But you'll pay for one on pay-per-view? <laughs> you know... We become, by vicarious, we, we, we become plugged into that, and so we're having that, uh, we're having that affair right along with them. And there it is. <laughs> the applause when I talk about adultery. <laughs> Good thing I looked and saw what was behind me. But Jesus said, don't do it. And when we, we, but this is the norm, this is acceptable. Friends, if we disregard the saying of Jesus, we're foolish. Divorce. There's only, oh man, it got quiet in here. Wish you were still applauding. Only, there are only, there are only, 
Only biblical grounds are acceptable. There are biblical grounds for divorce. Unfaithfulness. A spouse is unfaithful. They've broken the marriage covenant. Uh, God still hates divorce. And uh, only biblical grounds are acceptable. Well, she don't look like she used to. Guess what, Skippy? Neither do you. And uh, he's not as sensitive as he once was. He used to woo me when we're dating. Now he just watched TV. He doesn't pay any attention. You know, not grounds for divorce. Well, she doesn't cook like mama. <laughs> God help you. In my case, that's a good thing. My wife is an excellent cook. She... <laughs> not grounds for divorce. Jesus said, hear these words, hear these sayings of mine, and if you disregard them, it's foolish. Why, do you know why divorce is so painful? Do you know why it's so painful? Because the Bible says that the two become one flesh. Right? Listen to me. The Bible says that the two become one flesh. Now that is spiritual, that is emotional, that is uh, uh, mentally, psycho psychologically, financially, phys it's everything. Physically, all two becoming one flesh. And then what divorce does is it rips the one in half. It's like, I didn't do well in chemistry, but if you take two elements and you merge them together, they become a different element. They're, now they're one. You can't separate the elements. You can't separate the molecules. And if you do, you're ripping one thing in half. You follow me? That's what divorce is. Two become one flesh, and divorce rips that in half. That's why it's so painful. That's why Jesus said God hates divorce. That's why he said that there are only certain grounds for this. And it's run away. It's run amok, even in the church. He said, don't... Oh, man, it's quiet. He said, don't swear an oath. He said, don't say, well, I swear to God. Or I swear on my father's grave. Or I swear on a stack of Bibles. He's saying, let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. Don't swear by anything else because really you can't affect anything else. It's not up to you to do that. And if you swear an oath, you are, you are locked into completing it. So you be careful what you swear to. Because God says that up, the Old Testament law said up until death you have to keep that oath. He said, anything beyond yes and no is sin. He talks about, you still there? Amen. These sayings of mine. He said, he talks about neighbors and enemies. Who's your neighbor? Jesus said, anybody in need. He gives a parable. Uh, anybody in need is your neighbor. He said, in, in essence, love everyone. Love everyone. This, friends, and all of this, we cannot do without God's help. You can't do it in the flesh. you got some neighbors you cannot love of your own. You need the power of God in your life in order to do that. He's saying love your neighbors. Caring for those in need. This is called almsgiving. He said when you give alms. Not if. When you give alms. He's telling us that we need to care for those that are less fortunate. Care for the poor. Feed the hungry. Clothe the naked. Shoe the shoeless. House the, the people. There's a song about that. We want <laughs> But he's saying, do these things. He says, when you do this, not if. It's assumed. Jesus said, you're going to do this. And he said, and when you do this, do it in secret. Don't let everybody know how wonderful you are. Uh, well, I'm going to, this is mission support this week. So um, here comes the offering. Here, oh, get over here. He says, do it in secret. Don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. He's saying when you do your alms, do it in, don't, let, don't do it so everybody can see. It's not about you. Do it in secret. See, these sayings of mine. He talks about prayer. Again, he says when, not if. He assumes he, that you will pray. Remember the law written on our hearts. Uh, and when you pray, make it real before God. Don't try and, and make it sound you know, all flowers and all, don't worry about waxing adequate, just pray, just be real before God, just heart to heart, contrite and humble, dear God, here I am, the mess that I am, I love you, I don't know what else, just, that's a beautiful prayer, Amen. here I am Lord, I don't know anything else, here I am, I love you, great prayer, humble, contrite and real before God, 
Friends, what I'm saying, these things have become so common. They're treated so common in the world today. And even in our modern church, prayer and almsgiving and worship and all of these things, we, we, just, we don't care about these things. Adultery and, and all these things run amok in the church. Jesus said, those who hear these sayings of mine and don't do them, they're foolish. And he likens that person to one who builds their house on shifting sand. The uncertainty, the cone of uncertainty. Like a, building, a person building their home on the sand. <laughs> I, don't know what's behind me. I don't know what's behind me. Every 10 years, every 10 years, the Carolinas are hit directly by a hurricane. Every 3.9 years, they're hit indirectly by a hurricane. So the Carolina coast, directly or indirectly, every 3.9 years is affected by hurricanes. Our eastern coast, affected by hurricanes. And, uh, and so, some of the most valuable, beautiful homes in the nation are built on the islands along the Carolinas. Little more than a sandbar, these beautiful homes. 3.9 years, they're going to be hit directly or indirectly by a hurricane every 3.9 years. And so you see it. You see it every year. You see it every time the, a hurricane comes through. The homes are destroyed. They're washed out to sea. And the people are standing there, I've lost everything. And my heart goes out to them. And then they say, well, what are you going to do now? We're going to rebuild. And some people have rebuilt three and four times. One person I heard say, well, th that's it for us. This is the fourth time. We're done. Duh. <laughs> We're out of here. We're done. We, we can't do this anymore. They're going to rebuild. And so they keep rebuilding over and over again. The storms are coming, man. What are you going to do? We're going to rebuild. Jesus said, those who hear my words and don't do them, they're like those who build their houses on, on shifting sand. <laughs> I see people, friends, year after year, rebuilding on sandbars in life. Rebuilding their lives on sandbars. Again and again, they just keep rebuilding on the same place, and the same thing happens. I talk to people all the time. The marriages are ending, ending in divorce. Pastor, we just can't live together anymore. We just can't do this anymore. Why? Why? Well, because one or the other or both will not compromise. They won't meet in the middle. They won't give in. Uh, it's my way or the highway, and they insist on their own things. And so marriages end in divorce. Why? Because they're rebuilding on the same old shifting sand. I see children, uh, children out of control. Kids out of control. Little ones to big ones. Why are they out of control? Because the parents won't discipline they won't, so they do the same thing, and the kids grow up the same way, and they won't discipline. You say, well, pastor, you know, if I discipline my kid, he's not going to love me. He's not going to like me. I want to be friends. And, uh, you know, if I, if I discipline my children, they're going to rebel. Hey, pal, if you're there, they've already rebelled. If you're already at the stage where you're concerned about them rebelling, if you discipline, they've already rebelled. And you're, and you're going to, well, so your kids are out of control because you won't discipline. You're rebuilding on the sandbar, on shifting sand. Amen. You still with me? Amen. Finances in the shambles. Pastor, we just can't seem to make ends meet. I can't seem to make ends meet. I just can't seem to pay the bills. There's not enough money. Why? Because folks refuse to do what the Bible says. They refuse to adhere to biblical principles. They won't tithe, first of all. God says, if you honor, well, Pastor, that's Old Testament. That's the law you're referring to. Uh, now it's written on your heart. You shouldn't tithe because you have to. You should tithe because you want to. Amen. It's a biblical principle. God didn't throw the law away. He wrote it on our hearts. And so now we should tithe. We should, you know, 10% is a good guideline. You know, what's to keep you from tithing? What's to keep you from giving 15, 20, 30% to God? No, we're not, I'm not asking. We're not taking another collection. I'm just saying. <laughs> Your heart towards God. Well, some folks won't honor God. They won't honor him putting him first. And so their, their money, their household is a mess because they're not tired. Well, no doubt. You're, you're building, rebuilding on the same shifting sand. And on and on it goes. Listen, I'm sure you have your own list. 
And so you talk to people and you say, okay, here's the counsel. Here's the direction. This is what God's word says. These are the sayings of his. What will you do? I'm going to rebuild on. I'm going to stay right here on my sandbar. And so around comes the next storm and the next difficulty and the next problem comes. Friends, you're, look, at Ben Franklin was the first one who coined this phrase when he gave the definition of insanity. He's saying insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So you're going to rebuild in the same place. You're going to stay in the same... What are you going to do now? Stay here on my sandbar. Listen, you're living in the cone of uncertainty. You're living in the cone of uncertainty. Uh, but, but, we, but we're Christians. Listen, religious profession. Jesus says, those who hear and don't do. Are you still with me? Amen. How many of you have I lost? All right. <laughs> those who hear and don't do. See, there's the outward worship, and there's the outward form, and there's the outward conformity. We're Christians, and we go to church, and we do the things. We're... But friends, it's not inward. It's not, it's not that relationship with him. It's outward form. There's no real change of heart, no obedience, no self-denial. You're living in a cone of uncertainty. Phrases like, I think. I talk to people all the time. You do too. Well, I think. I think, I think, you know, God is, will just love to have me in church. I think it's just fine that I, that I don't give any money. I think, I think the church should give me money. That's what I think. I feel, I feel just good about myself. I feel, I feel that, you know, I think, I've, I believe, I believe God, you know, just accepts us all the way we are. Yeah. People think, feel, and believe some really absurd things, don't they? Have you ever heard some things that people think? Like we came from aliens and they're coming back for us? You hear me? I think, I feel, I believe. I don't care what you think, feel, or believe. What does God's word say? Jesus said if you hear these, that hear these things that I say and don't keep them, you're like a foolish person building their, their houses on a sandbar. What is it? Is it is what you believe or what you think and what you feel? Is it founded in the Word of God? Oh my! Wow. Secondly, and I only have two points. The wise builder. Jesus says, "The wise builder. This is the one who hears and does." This is a life built upon a solid foundation. It's a life that's built upon the rock. See. Uh, uh, a person, a wise builder is not content with just hearing. Good sermon, preacher. I give that about a six. Last week was a five and a half. You know, you rate me better than that, don't you? Don't I get a little better than that? But even still, I don't really care about the number. Well, people that hear but don't do. You li listen, don't, here he's saying... You're not content with just hearing the Word of God. Every message you hear preached or anything that you read, listen to me, should be compared to God's Word. Hear me. You take this message this morning, and you, you hear what I say, and then you look and you say, okay, I, hear what the, I, got the, I got the outline. Now, how does that match up with, what, with his sayings, with these sayings of his? How does this message match up with, and then you take that and you present it before God, and this is what you should do today. This is what you should do every day. And you say, Lord, I've heard the message, and I've heard your word, and now I lay it before you. God, does this apply to me now? Listen, that's what we should do with everything we hear and everything we read. Lord, uh, does, how does, does this apply to me at this time? And if God speaks to you by your spirit and says, yes, this is what I wanted you to hear today, then you take that word and you act upon it. You say, okay, then this is what I will do. I will listen to the words of yours. Lord, I will, I, uh, regarding the, you know, the adultery, regarding you know, the prayer, regarding the almsgiving, I will take what you say and I will apply it to my life. And thank you, Lord. And if you present it to God and he says, no, not for you, you're, doing, you're fine right now, today's a good day for you, I'm, this does not apply to you today, then you, you don't disregard it and kick it aside. You hide it in your heart and you say, thank you, Lord, then it's here. And when I need to hear that, I have it. When that situation arises, I've hid your word in my heart so I won't sin against you. I know your word now and I'll make application when the time comes. You follow me? 
This is a person who hears the Word of God and acts upon it. This is a wise builder. Listen, friends. The storms come to both the wise and the foolish. This is so important. Don't worry about the time. This, the storms come for both the wise and the foolish. Jesus said, And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon the house. Listen. The rain it came, and the floods, they came, and the winds did blow and beat upon the house. No one escapes the storms. No one escapes the storms. Whether you're wise or whether you're foolish, the storm's coming. The storms are coming. See, we often have a false sense of security, like the folks on the Carolinas. The storm's coming, it's a category two, category three, 120 mile an hour winds slamming into the coast. And listen, you've heard it. You've seen these people on TV. And are you getting out? No, we, we heard the warnings, but we're going to stay here, you know, to, to, to protect the house. <laughs> what? Right? Am I, come on, you've heard it. We're coming. To, we're going to watch. I don't want to watch the house. Watch it. Do what? So here comes the wind. You know, Irene is coming. You're going to say, no, you stop right here. You stop right here. <laughs> what are you going to do? If the house gets blown away, you're going with it. But you heard him, right? No, we're, we're not leaving. We're going to stand right. We're going to ride it out. <laughs> Why? Because they've warned us before, and it was just fine. And so we're going we're gonna to stick it out. You know, we, they warned us before, and it wasn't as bad as they said, and so we're going to stay right here because we've seen, we've seen storms before, and the house is still standing. Or, you know, this, that old building has been there, for, you know, been there for 200 years. It's endured a lot of hurricanes and a lot of warnings. We're just going to stay right here because, obviously, it can handle it. We've seen a lot of storms, but you haven't seen them all. You haven't seen them all. You haven't seen Katia, or Katia, or Katya, or whatever you call it. <laughs> I don't know where it's going. You know, some of the models take it out to sea, God willing. I don't know where it's going. Cone of uncertainty. But regardless of whether it's Katia, or whether it's Marie, or Mary, or whatever it is, the next one, or whether it's, you know, Nicole, or, or you know, Nike, whatever, they're coming. I'm just, I don't mean to be facetious, they're coming. Yes, I've weathered storms. My family has weathered storms. My home has weathered storms. But you haven't seen them all. You haven't seen the next one. And you have no idea what that storm, uh, what, what it packs, what punch it packs. And so, friends, you've you, you got to take, take note of this. We have a false sense of security. Listen, unless you, unless you have a solid foundation, unless you are on the rock there will be a storm that will overwhelm you. I've endured a lot of storms, but you haven't seen them all. And unless you're built upon the rock Christ Jesus, there will be a storm that will all overwhelm you. Sometimes Jesus will rebuke the storm. The, devil, the disciples were out in the boat. You know the story. They're out on the sea, and uh, a great storm arose, and it was so violent that the wind was blowing the waves into the boat. The Bible says that the boat was filled with water. And, and the disciples were afraid they're going to die. This is it. It's over for us. And Jesus stands up. He, the Bible says that he arose and rebuked the storm. And he said, he said, peace be still. I love that. One of my favorite phrases, fra favorite verses in the Bible. Peace be still. And there was a great calm. Sometimes Jesus will rise up in the middle of your storm and he'll say, peace be still. And then there's a great calm. Sometimes, friends, he allows the storm to come. And he allows the storm to stay. Listen, Psalm 61, verses 1 through 3, I'm almost done. The psalmist said, hear my cry, O God. Attend unto my prayer. From the end of the earth will I cry. I don't know where that is, friends, but I think I've been there. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from my enemy. 
In the midst of the storm, he says, Lord, when my heart is overwhelmed, when the storms come that overwhelm me, lead me to the rock. Lead me to the foundation. Lead me to the rock, Christ Jesus. Because you have been a shelter for me in the midst of the storm. Friends, if your life is upon the rock, the floods will not overwhelm you. He will be your shelter in the time of storm. Isaiah 26, 3 Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. In the cone of uncertainty called life, there's a rock of security. I can't tell you what will happen. When I put this message together, Irene was coming. And I didn't know if we would have church, and I had Irene in mind. When I, was, when I wrote here, I cannot tell you what will happen. Well, friends, we know what happened with Irene. But Katia's on her way. And I can tell you, I don't know what will happen. It is a cone of uncertainty. I know there will be wind, and I know there will be rain, and for some there will be floods, both physically and spiritually, or, or, or figuratively. And let me just say this, and, and I'll be done. Even if your physical house is washed out to sea, hear me, even if the storms come and knock down your timbers, even if the rains come and wash away your house's foundation, even if everything you own and possess is washed away, friends, if you're on Christ Jesus, you will be okay. You will survive the storm. Because he is a shelter and he is a refuge and he is the rock. If your life is built upon the rock, Christ Jesus then you will, you'll be okay. Father, I thank you for your word. God, I ask this morning that this message, Lord, would, 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 first of all, it would challenge those outside. Lord, those who have heard these words of yours and who have not done them. I pray, God, that you will cause them to see how foolish it is, how very foolish it is, Lord. They are like those who build their houses on sand when the storms come, and they do, and they will, the homes are washed out. Everything they have is gone. I pray, Lord, that they would see to do these things that you have said. And, Lord, I pray that it would be an encouragement to those, Father, who have heard your words and do them. Those who have hid your word in their hearts. Those, oh God, who stand upon the rock, Christ Jesus. Let this be an encouragement to them, Lord, knowing that if they are rooted and grounded in Christ Jesus, nothing, nothing, nothing shall knock them off their foundation. I pray, God, in all of this, that Jesus Christ would be glorified. Speak to the hearts of all your people this morning. Speak to the hearts of all those that are sitting here or watching this, Father.